The title of the sermon this morning is Why Am I Here? Why am I here? Hallelujah. <clears throat> we are on earth. God has brought us to this planet called earth for a reason. We are not just here to fill the earth and to be counted among those people that are here on earth. But there is a reason why God has brought us here. And it's very important that all of us know why we are here. <clears throat> you see, when we are born uh, and we are just, you know, uh, we come into this world... We are small little babies that can't even see properly. Uh, we don't know uh, why we are here. We are not even concerned about the reasons uh, that we are here. Probably we are confused about this world uh, where you have to breathe oxygen. Uh, you know, that is mixed with air. Uh, you are wondering, <laughs> what is happening? Why? I think that's why children, they cry when they are born. The first thing that people, want, you know, the nurses want to find out uh, is whether you will cry. If you don't cry, they will pinch you a bit. Uh, and we cry because we are like, oh no, this is not the, a watery place that I am from. This, I'm not swimming now. I have to use my own lungs uh, to breathe. We are just uh, here. All we want is to suck milk. We just want to drink and eat. Again, when you are hungry, you cry. When you are happy, uh, you cry. When you want to go to the toilet, you cry. You just, that's how you communicate. Uh, you don't know why you are here. Actually, as you know, I've been doing psychology. I have learned that a child uh, sees themselves as one with the mother at that stage. They don't see the difference. They're just one with the mother. And as they grow up, they begin to see that, oh, I'm a, a different person. I'm independent from uh, uh, my own mother. <clears throat> Now, when we are at that stage, we really don't know. We don't understand. We, we're just existing as part of what we are finding there. Do you think Jesus knew who he was at that stage? What do you think? Baby Jesus. Baby Jesus. Baby Jesus. Can I ring Pinavan? I love you, you are my savior, you are my savior, all the time, all the time. Did Jesus know, baby Jesus, did he know that he was your savior? No, <laughs> he didn't know. Jesus had to grow up to discover who he was as he was growing up. So even the Son of God, God himself, had to discover his purpose as he began to interact the, with the world. As a 12-year-old boy, he started asking questions to the teachers of the law. He wanted to understand the ways of his father. Hallelujah. And the father was continually uh, revealing himself to Jesus, the Son, until Jesus came to a realization of, oh, now I know who I am. And because we are like, Jesus was like us, human beings in every way, I think we are also in the same journey. As we grow in the Lord, we begin to realize that, oh, I am not who I thought I was all of this time. Hallelujah. And I want to be honest with you, I have been discovering myself lately, as lately as 2018. Hallelujah. You see, when I responded to the call of the Lord years back, I thought, now I knew what I was here for. But I have been discovering that there is more to this muluki than what I thought all along. And I believe that if I have been discovering a lot of things that I did not know about the purpose for which I was born, and I think I am in the purpose of God, that means that all of us are in the same boat. Hello? Amen. Are you with me? So when we grow up from being babies and then we become teenagers and some hormones start kicking in, we then start becoming aware of many different things that are happening around us. That is where we ask ourselves, who am I? What's my identity? That is where we try to fit in. That is why we try and discover. That's why suddenly then we rebel against the parents that have been, you know, our anchor. For all. Our parents were right all along until we get to this teenage stage. And suddenly they are wrong and we are right. 
and we rebel. We are angry at them. We don't want to hear them saying anything uh, that we, we, is, is against us. We are going through a process of self-discovery. And for many people, they can really lose it there. Hallelujah. As you discover yourself and you realize that, oh, I have my own uh, personality. I have my own being. It can be a very rocky time. It can be a very rocky time for parents and for children at that time. Parents are just like, now who is this child? I thought I knew my daughter. I thought I knew my son. I'll talk about daughters because I, I'm raising daughters. <laughs> The boys, they, the girls, they look at, uh, at the mirror and they begin to see that their faces are not as smooth as they, they used to be. They want to take selfies and they want to put on their profiles and the pimples are a problem, so they use the filter. The filter doesn't work. You know, I must be perfect. Who am I? What people say about them becomes more important than what their parents say about them. Who am I? They are discovering themselves. This morning we are asking the question, why am I here? And it's very important uh, because if you do not know who you are, you will never know why you are here. Hallelujah. This is very, very important. And at this stage of teenagehood and then we are going through, we ask very important uh, questions like, what is my purpose? Not just who am I, but what is my purpose uh, here on earth? The people begin to, uh, uh, children begin to ask questions. Am I a mistake? Do my parents love me? Why are they always shouting at me? Do they love me? Am I important to them? Why does it seem like the whole world is against me? Are these my real parents? If they are my real parents, why are they always shouting? Why are they always angry? Why are they so frustrated? Are they my parents? Hallelujah. People are trying to discover who they are and their identity becomes very, very important. And they try and find their identity by picking pieces of, you know, what they like from different personalities, from different people. That's why celebrities become important to them. Dressing like celebrities become important to them because they want to be identified with certain things or certain people. That is why rejection becomes so painful. If you reject them, it becomes a problem. It's just a mess in their lives. Hallelujah. Amen. It is a difficult time of self-discovery. When you reject them, they faint. They are sick. Can I live with it? Somebody was playing that song the whole night around my house. Arbulosi jami kijale rato he When you don't know who you are what how people receive you how they accept you become so important that when they reject you wa idibal Hallelujah if it's a very critical time. Young children commit suicide. You know, teenagers commit suicide this time because they are rejected by those that they really, really liked. Somehow, this becomes so important that nothing else matters. They take their lives because they feel like, you know, being accepted becomes something so important for them at that time. It's about life and death. And then when we become uh, adults, when we have gone through such a rough patch of rejection, of not knowing who we are, now we are adults that are broken. 
We don't know who we are. We did not go through that stage of being a teenager properly. That's now when we're just living with no purpose. We skipped certain stages. You know, in the growth of a child, there are very critical stages all along. If you skip, you, have you heard about midlife crisis? When you get to a certain age and you feel that you have skipped some stages and you see an old man with white beard now starting to dress like a teenager, buying expensive uh, racing cars and motorbikes and, you know, they become cool. Have you seen your grandfather trying to be cool? <laughs> what's up? What's up? What's up? <laughs> old man, what's going on here? Somebody skipped some critical stages of their lives. Now they want to go back. Hallelujah. Then we lose our purpose. We, and then we lose our faith. But we can't admit it because at this stage, everyone expects you to be in charge of your life. Can I, that word, that word that we learned. Generativity. Generativity. It's a stage where now you are living a legacy for yourself. You are working to live a legacy. It's no longer about you anymore. What people say, you are working to make sure that when you are gone, those that you leave behind have something. We are expected to be at that stage of generativity, but you skipped some stages trying to discover yourself. So you can't begin to fulfill your purpose because you have to go back there and ride motorbikes. You have to dress. Imagine re, re mudisa, ni kama chisa nyana, kadisho tinyana. Huh? Hey, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up? You look at this old man and you think, ah. And he begins to go to the gym. He wants to destroy the blessing. How are you, how are you going to do your purpose when you don't even know who you are and where you are in life? Hallelujah. The question is, are you alive as you? Are you alive as the one that God created, that brought into this world? When you are on earth and you are not doing what you were meant to do, you are basically dead. You are just a body that is walking around. And you get caught up by anything that you think will make life meaningful to you. That is why what people say becomes more important to you. You are always looking for the latest trends. So that you can fit in. You don't have your own direction. You don't have anything that you are pursuing. You are just checking the atmosphere and finding out what is it that I can do that will show that I am in the times. It is a very terrible way of existing. In a, a place where you are not fulfilling the dreams and the desires that are wired within you. Do you know that within you, there are dreams and desires that God has wired? I have a purpose that is very different from my wife's purpose. In terms of ministry, she has a heart for women. She, had, she has a heart for children when it comes to ministry. Hallelujah. I have a heart for, for, for the broken. I spend hours and hours on broken people. That keeps me going. That's me. That's not her. Hallelujah. Give her women. Give her children. She excels. Give her appointment after appointment and appointment. You will frustrate her. That's not her. And when you discover why you are on earth, what is wired within you, and you begin to move according to your wiring, your programming, then it does not matter how hard it is. Somehow, the oil keeps on flowing to lubricate every moving part. You remember the time that Jesus was with the, wom the, the, the woman at the well, and they wanted to give him food. What did he say? They were hungry. They had walked a very long distance from Jerusalem. 
And they went into town to buy him food. He, when they wanted to offer him food, he said, no, 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 wait, wait, guys. My food is to do, what does food do? It gives you strength to go on. It gives you energy to go on. He says, my food, that which gives me energy to go on, that which strengthens me is doing the will of my father. And let me tell you, when you are doing the will of your father, when you are doing what you are wired for, there is something that flows. That is, you cannot explain. I am so fulfilled. You know, when I was in Bubonong, I worked like a donkey. Huh? In the mornings, I was running LTS every morning from 9 o'clock to half 11, 12. In the evenings, I was preaching in the revival. And then in between, I was counseling one on one. I think I counseled more than 30 old ladies in that week that I was there. I preached nine sermons, just preaching. And then I taught about uh, three uh, morning. But you know, my teaching goes for two hours when I'm talking about broken hearts. And then I counseled so many. And although I was physically tired, the fulfillment, that is why I'm still, you know, uh, the joy of having served in Bubono is still going on in me. Because I saw how God transformed lives. I saw how God healed hearts, how he healed bodies. I was so blessed by old women who understand the truth. There is something about doing what you were born for, children of God, that cannot be replaced by anything. Why are you on earth? Are you alive? Are you really alive? Or you are just existing and going through life? You see, this world has defined for us what we must do. Go to school, finish, go to university, finish, look for a job, you know, finish, retire, finish, die. Huh? And some of us, we don't expect anything outside of this defined things. Why are you on earth? Have you asked God? God, I've been asking God, God, who am I? Because I think I'm discovering myself again. Who am I? Because once I understand who I am, especially in these last days, I'll begin to understand what my purpose is in these last days. Hallelujah. We are like onions. Eh? God is always peeling some layers out. And then you discover, ah, eh? is this me? And when you think, you know, he peels some more. Ah. Do you know why we become religious? We get to a particular layer, it excites us, and we say, yes, this is it. I have arrived. If you can, please listen to the Wednesday teaching that I did here. I, I, was, I didn't have a Bible. I was just standing here and speaking. I believe as the Lord wanted me to speak. And I was speaking about the Bible. It's there on our, I think uh, they will upload it also. On our Facebook live, it was black and white. They pressed something by mistake. But listen to it. Just to summarize it. 2,000 years ago, some of our brothers and sisters recorded their experience with God in the Bible. That's what we are reading. We are reading their experience with God. So that we can be motivated with the foundation of their experience with God to have our own experiences with God. In other words, the Bible is not meant to limit us to what is written in it, but it is meant to propel us to have our own stories that generations to come can read about. I won't go any deeper. <laughs> Hallelujah. In other words, you have a story to tell. About your own experience, not Peter's experience with God. Your own experience with God. But you cannot have your own genuine, authentic experience with God if you do not know who you are. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, if you want God to reveal 
who you are and your purpose on earth, you need to have an authentic relationship with him. Oh, the father is crying for authentic sons. You have been hearing a lot about sons and sons. And God is crying for those who are authentic, who are saying, I want to know my father. As a counselor, I meet many young people who come into my office and say, I want to know my father. I know him by name. I know where his name, but I don't know him. I want to know my father. You see, part of our identity is knowing our source. You need to know who you are. You need to know where you come from. You need to be intimate with your source. Naturally, that is our parents. Spiritually, that is God. And the natural affects the spiritual. That's why you need to deal with your natural problems so that the spiritual door begins to open. God wants an authentic relationship with his sons. When you look at people like Paul, we are blessed by you know, their experiences with God. But do you know that they were not always like that? I want us to go to the book of Acts chapter 22 from verse 1. Those who are concerned about jackets, you'll forgive me. It's hot. Some people get very upset when you take off your jacket. So I'm apologizing. Please forgive me. The Bible says forgive us each other. Acts chapter 22 from verse 1. This is Paul writing. Actually, this is Paul speaking. He says, men, brethren, and fathers. Okay, let me change to NIV. He says, men, brethren, and fathers, hear, okay, brothers and fathers, listen to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramic, they became very quiet. And this is what Paul says. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was roughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way uh, to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Verse 8. About noon as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Soul, soul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. He replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. I will stop there. You can read all the way to verse 22. But here is Paul, somebody that we are reading his letters in the Bible. He wrote most of uh, the New Testament. About, I think uh, two-thirds of the New Testament was written by him. That is a huge part of the New Testament. And we admire Paul. We admire his commitment to God. We, ad we read his writings. We are inspired. We understand God better. We understand the mystery of Christ better. Through Paul. He had some amazing experiences with God. But we should never forget that Paul was not always like that. Amen. Paul was not always like that. Paul was a persecutor of the church. Hallelujah. He was a man who was zealous. He was a Pharisee who was trained properly from a young age to be a Pharisee. When he killed Christians, 
He was convicted. He was convinced within himself that he was doing the will of God. Hallelujah. He was sure. As many of us are sure today that what we are doing or where we are, we are doing the will of God. Do you know that Pharisees believed a lot of things that we believe? They believed in the resurrection of the dead. They believed in their Torah, their Bible. Very well. They believed in angels like we believe in angels. They believed in the coming of the Messiah. There are so many similarities between us and Pharisees. Of course, because Jesus was always hammering them, we always take them and put them, but we are Pharisees. That is why we are upset when somebody takes off their jacket. <laughs> when they don't wear a suit and a tie, we are upset because the, the Pharisee in us says, no, you cannot do that. Don't break the tradition. Hallelujah. Amen. We are just like them. He was just like that. He was convinced. It was the uh, bishops the archbishops of the day who wrote letters for him to go and arrest those who trusted in the way, who believed in Jesus. And so he speaks about his experience, how on his way to Damascus, you know the story, how Jesus appeared to him and said, soul, soul, why do you persecute me? And interestingly, when he answers, he says, who are you? Lord. When you encounter the Lord, even though you don't know him, you will know he is the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. He says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Jesus had already risen and gone to the Father. Why, what does he mean? Whom you are persecuting. When you persecute the church, you are persecuting the body of Christ. You are persecuting him. That's why you must take yourself seriously. Because you are not just an individual. You are not just on your own. You are part of the body of Christ. When the devil touches you, do you know how jealous God is about you? I have learned that God does not even want a scratch on me. You scratch me. Not humans, demons. You scratch me, he will come after you. He will punish you. Just a scratch. The father loves his children. You are part of the body of Christ. So Paul was raised by parents who believed what he believed. He saw this as he was growing up. He was taught about the law thoroughly. He went even under Hamaliel, who was a known teacher of the law, respected. They used to consult him when they were confused about some of the things that the law was saying. This was a man who had a reputation, a very powerful reputation for that matter. Hallelujah. And he was exposed to violence in Acts chapter 7, verse 8, uh, 58. As they are stoning Stephen, Paul is there watching. No remorse whatsoever. And they are laying down their uh, 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 clothes right there. He's a witness. And he's happy about what he is doing. You see, religion is so dangerous that you will go ahead and kill somebody and feel justified. As many are killing each other today in the church. We may not be doing it physically by stoning, but our words are stones that are hitting. Hitting and hitting and hitting and criticizing. Uh, we are trying to, 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 to quench the fire that we see somewhere because it does not you know, fit in our religious convictions. So there are stones that have been thrown all the time and we are hoping that you will die and stop doing what you are doing and conform to us so that we can be, they can be unproductive as you are. Religion is death. Jesus, he says, you are like whitewashed tombs decorated on the outside. Yes, you are dressed well, nice suit, all of that, but inside it is bones, is the rot of flesh that is dressed very nicely on the outside. Death. And what can death produce except death? Are you alive? Do you know? Who, are you alive to God, not to religion? Are you alive to God? 
Do you know who you are in him? So as there's a stone in Stephen, he's there and he's very satisfied. So because of what he had been taught as he was growing up, it was just okay for him. He started believing that persecuting the Christians was the good thing, was the right thing. He was very zealous as a religious man. I think one of the most dangerous things is religion. Religious people, uh, they have no tolerance whatsoever. Because they are sure they are right. I've dealt with a religious spirit, the spirit of the Antichrist. Oh, it is sure about its story. It's sure that it's hearing from God. It speaks with authority. And you cannot say anything different to them. Because they believe that they are right. And they will go to the extent of killing because of their convic uh, convictions. And when the Lord appeared to Paul, suddenly his eyes were opened. And it was significant that he became blind after his encounter with the Lord. God wanted to show him that you have been blind all along. He, he began to, to, to grope around, uh, you know, obviously to him it was darkness. Those who were with him had to take him, lead him to Damascus, where he was led to somebody who will then pray for him after three days. His spiritual blindness was signified by the physical blindness that he came under. Because when you are blind, suddenly you are helpless. You don't have everything under control. Religion says you must be in control. Make sure things don't get out of the way. Religion wants to control things. Religion has no time for the Holy Spirit to come in a religious church. People cannot just come and dance here when people are worshipping. What is that? And if you are upset by that, I come against the religious spirit in you. Amen. It is religion. It gets obsessed by things of the spirit because it cannot control the things of the spirit. Religious churches, they manage everything because they don't want the service to get out of control. And by the way, if you don't have an authentic relationship with God, you have to manage everything because you don't know what may happen. You are trying to manage God. You cannot manage God. You cannot put God in your box. He's not limited to your box. He goes beyond your box. He says, behold, I, knew, I do a new thing. If you have put him in a box, will you be able to see when he's doing a new thing? Or you begin to rebuke the devil? Hallelujah. So Paul begins to acknowledge the Lord. And then he begins to build an intimate relationship with the Father. And all of the wrong beliefs that were in him begins to be stripped away from him. And the eyes of his understanding begins to open up. Wow, what an amazing, an amazing. In Acts chapter 23, the same Paul faces the Sanhedrin, the, the leaders who, had, who were sending him before to do all of the dirty work. But he does not hide from them. He's not afraid anymore. He knows that they will kill him, but he's not afraid. He looks at them in the eye and he tells them about his new purpose in God. He does not fear for his life. He says, my brothers, I fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. Can you speak like that? That you have fulfilled everything. Your duty to God in all conscience. You can only say that when you know who you are in God. And they were very angry and they wanted him dead. So after he had an authentic relationship with God, an encounter with God, he did not care about his life anymore. If you are still so concerned about your life, about your safety, about what people say about you, ask yourself, have you had an authentic, uh, authentic relationship with the Father? He says, you must die to yourself. Crucify yourself. Carry your cross. You must be ready to die. When Jesus was carrying the cross, he was carrying the thing that was going to execute him. 
Hallelujah. Are you willing to carry your cross? Or you are still too concerned about your safety? What people will say? If I was too concerned about whether people will approve of what I am doing, we will just have a normal religious church here. I'll do my part. I'll go home and come back again, do my part. No, I'm not just going to be another pastor. Who is recorded in AFM? We had Pastor Smama. He's dead now. He's going to be with the Father. No, I refuse to be normal. And for you to go ahead and pursue the abnormal, you need to have an authentic, you need to hear him, my sheep, hear my voice. Do you know who you are? Are you alive, really? What is your purpose here on earth? It's very important for the church to have an authentic relationship uh, with Christ, with the Father. We need to know who we are here on earth. I see my time is up, but I have a lot to say. We don't understand why we are here on earth. That's why we are confused, many of us. That's why we are, you know, trying this and that. You see, when you understand who you are, it doesn't matter how many hateful things are going around you. It doesn't matter how much opposition is around you. Do you know about Jesus? Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says he came to his own. And his own rejected him. Jesus, our Savior, he came to his own to die for his own, but his own rejected him. If Jesus did not understand who he is, and he was defined by how people received him, will he ever have been able to fulfill the will of God? No. When he was telling Peter and the other disciples that I am going to Jerusalem where I will be persecuted, and ultimately I will be killed, he knew that's what he came for. He went right into the enemy's camp because he knew that his purpose was within the enemy's camp. Let me tell you, people will always have opinions about you. When you are religious, they will criticize you. When you are non-religious, they will criticize you. You remember what Livingston used to say, people have mouth to talk, so they will talk. You will never satisfy people because everyone has their own view. You'll have half happy, half unhappy. Sometimes you have two happy and 90 unhappy. That's why you need to know who you are. Jesus went straight into opposition because he knew that his purpose was in there. Hallelujah. His purpose was through the storm, through the pain of what he was going through. President Rosie, just come. He would have been very stagnant if what the people's opinions became so important. But he knew that he had to defeat everything that was thrown at him to be able to fulfill the purpose while he was here on earth. And Jesus had a very important reason uh, to fulfill his purpose. What was that reason? Our salvation. Hallelujah. If Jesus had failed uh, to go through this, no matter how much opposition there was, the whole world was going to whew, collapse. Remember that everything was made through him. Everything in him, everything holds together. So if he had failed, everything would just have disappeared completely. As they begin to sing a song, I want us to stand up. And I just want us to speak to God about our purpose on earth. Why do you want to be a pastor? Why are you a minister? Why do you want to be a minister? Why do you want to spread the gospel? Let's all stand. There is power in knowing why 
Because when you know how, why, an intense enthusiasm is created within you. You have a strong desire to walk in your purpose when you know why. Why you are doing what you are doing. And when that enthusiasm, when you connect to your purpose of being, then quickly you align with the will of God for your life. And the joy begins to flow through you. And the Father can open the heavens and say, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Let's raise our hands to the Lord. And for about a minute, just talk to God about your purpose, your reason for being here on earth. Ask him why you are here.